uh, uh, part 57 in our series uh, of the uh, Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. And, and as we've been dealing with this, we've been in Paul's, what they call his second missionary journey. Uh, there are three missionary journeys recorded in the book of Acts, as theologians usually call them. Uh, we are in the second missionary journey. If you remember, we talked about a number of things uh, so far. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 18, uh, we saw, uh, you know, he's gone to Troas, he's gone to Philippi, he's gone to Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, all that. You know, uh, uh, prior to that, in chapter 17, and then Athens, uh, Greece, and now uh, he is in Corinth. And that's basically where we are in chapter 18, where we start off in the city of Corinth. As all of you are well aware, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, that was kind of his troubled church. A lot of people got saved from the Corinthians. Uh, a lot of people accepted Christ, but they were from primarily a pagan background, a lot of idolatry, a lot of immorality, a lot of issues that needed to be dealt with. And you know as well as I do, uh, when we first get born again, we change instantly on the inside. Side, but it takes time to renew our minds uh, to change on the outside, right? And so Paul had to write, eventually, he had to write two letters to the Corinthian church. First and second th uh, Corinthians is what we call it. And both of those letters are full of correction, uh, full of insights, yes, but full of correction and uh, just trying to help those Corinthians become stronger uh, believers in Christ. Now, a uh, review from last time, as we look at this, the review from uh, chapter 18. Uh, first of all, what about Corinth? Up on the screen, Corinth was the political capital of Achaia. It was also a center for worship of Aphrodite, the goddess of fertility, and it housed the major temple of Apollo. Because of the sensuous nature of the religious cult of Aphrodite, Corinth had a reputation for being a city of immorality. Beginning in the 5th century B.C., the Greeks used the term, a word meaning to act like a Corinthian as a synonym uh, for sexual immorality. You remember I mentioned that to you, uh, that they basically had this, uh, uh, this terminology, this name that they would say to people uh, that were immoral. They'll say, you're just, you're a Corinthian. And that was supposed to be a derogatory thing and an a, and a insult to them because of their immorality because to be a Corinthian and sexual immorality went together in the minds of that culture. And that just gives you an idea as to how severe it was uh, in the city of Corinth. Like somebody said, when they went from Athens, Greece to Corinth, I didn't mention this to you last time, but one author said this, it was kind of like going from Boston to Las Vegas. You understand? From Athens, Greece to Corinth was sort of like going from Boston, a place culture with culture and, and uh, the arts and things like that, going from Boston to Las Vegas, the city of sin. It's kind of how that made out or how that was. All right, and so uh, that was a big change for the Apostle Paul. And you remember we mentioned last time uh, that Paul was a little bit fearful. He had to fight fear, it seems, uh, to go to the city of Corinth because of the reputation of that city. But he had great results overall. And then we saw this from verses 2 and 3 from uh, Acts chapter 18. Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla for the very first time. We don't know if they were saved yet, uh, but he began to work with them as a tent maker because they both, uh, both Aquila and Priscilla, they were a husband and wife. Priscilla is the wife, Aquila is the husband. They had been driven out of Rome uh, because uh, uh, Claudius had, had put down the rule that all the Jews need to leave because some of them were causing problems and what have you. And so Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, they left Rome. Uh, they went uh, to Corinth and they were practicing their trade of tent making, which is better understood as leather working. They were leather workers. They didn't just make tents. Uh, they also were leather workers. And Paul had that same trade. Even though he had been a Pharisee, a rabbi, uh, in that day rabbis and Pharisees uh, almost always if not always, had a trade as well uh, in order to rely on. And so he met them for the very first time. They became great helpers in the ministry and lifelong friends of Paul. They're mentioned again in chapter 18, verse 18. We'll get to them a little bit later uh, in this uh, uh, teaching as well. And then also in verse 26, as well as in Romans 16, 3 and 1 Corinthians 16, 19, Paul referred to them as helpers in the ministry. They were fellow laborers for Christ and, and that kind of thing. They were very valuable. And other than right here, uh, after this, Priscilla is always mentioned first rather than Aquila. And Priscilla, it's understood that probably she was the one uh, that was uh, maybe more anointed uh, in the area of ministry or whatever. Sometimes that happens. Uh, but in any case, uh, I find that interesting. Maybe you don't. That's okay. Anyway, verses 4 through 6. 
This is still review. Paul reasoned and persuaded some as he preached in the synagogue. Others opposed him. Paul turns to the Gentiles. You remember uh, the Jews as a whole opposed the message. And then he said, well, you know, basically it says that he, uh, that he uh, shook off his garments. He, 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 he uh, dusted off his feet, so to speak. And he said, now I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. That meant the Gentiles uh, in the city of Corinth. So he focused on them rather than trying to convince any remaining Jews uh, that were unbelievers. And then going on, verses 7 and 8, the church now meets next door uh, to the synagogue in the house of justice the ruler of the synagogue and his family become believers verses 9 through 10 the lord encourages paul in a night vision and that was such a wonderful thing if you read that encouragement in verses uh, 9 and uh, through 10 uh, about this encouragement the lord in a night vision appears to paul and says no harm's going to come to you i am with you what great comfort that must have brought uh, to the apostle paul because he had been in city after city where he had been persecuted he'd been beaten he'd been stoned in one place in Lystra, uh, he had gone through all sorts of persecution. And so in, in his humanity, wouldn't he have been concerned with the reputation of that city of Corinth? I'm sure that there was such temptation to be fearful, uh, to be concerned about what he was going to face there. And so the Lord supernaturally, in a night vision, perhaps a dream, uh, spoke to Paul and said, I'm not going to let any harm to, uh, come to you. Uh, you're going to be all right, and that kind of thing. And so thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Lord bringing comfort and encouragement. Amen? And then verse 11, Paul stays in Corinth for a year and six months, which is longer than any other place other than Ephesus. And we're going to deal with Ephesus a little bit uh, tonight as well. And so that's the basic review uh, you see now. Uh, uh, actually, we'll come back to that. Let's go to, our, let's go to our Bibles now. We left off and finished up to verse 11 last time. Now we're going to uh, pick up with verse 12. And I want us to read verses 12 through 17. Is that okay? Acts 18, verses 12 through 17 is where we're going to begin and read. And then we're going to go back to our notes, and we're going to expound on, on these things. Now, it says, when, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge in such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes the ruler of the synagogue and beat him before the judgment seat but Galileo took no notice of these things all right now let's turn to our notes and let's uh, expound on some of this before we go further notice now it says this again is exposition of chapter uh, 18 continued letter a verses 12 through 17 Galileo the proconsul of Achaia now who was Galileo I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea who he was it's written down here number one he is a well-known historical figure showing once again the historical accuracy of Luke. Galileo was also the brother of the well-known philosopher of that day, namely Seneca. Some of you might have remembered uh, uh, reading a little bit of Seneca, maybe not, uh, but he was a great, well-known philosopher of that day, Seneca. Dr. Bob Utley makes the following comments. And the quote, from biblical and extra-biblical sources. What's extra-biblical? That means other than biblical sources. In other words, other historical sources. It says, from biblical and extra-biblical sources, we learn that this was a fair and competent political leader. Talking about Galileo. His brother Seneca says of him, even those who love my brother Galileo to the utmost of their power do not love him enough. And no man was ever as sweet to one as Galileo is to all. This political appointee helps us to date Paul's journeys. He was a proconsul for two and one half years starting in A.D. 51. And so if he was proconsul during this time, uh, then that gives us a time period, a basic window of time, when the Apostle Paul was in Corinth, right around A.D. 51, 52. Uh, he was there as proconsul for only about a year and a half. And so we get a real good idea as to when the Apostle Paul uh, went and, and evangelized in Corinth as well. Now, one of the things that we want to make sure that you understand is this idea of Luke. Luke is understood by even non-Christians as being like a top-rated historian. In this book of Acts especially, we see people, places, and things mentioned over and over and over again that is confirmed uh, in other, as we, as we noted, extra-biblical sources, other historical sources. And so Luke is thought of by even, again, as I said, non-Christian uh, uh, experts uh, to be a, a top-rated historian. And so why is this important? Because not only did he talk about 
places, people, and things. He also talked about miracles, signs and wonders, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Are you following what I'm saying to you? And so a logical mind, I think, I would propose to you, if we believe that he is accurate pertaining to people, places, and things, why would we not believe that he's accurate pertaining to signs, wonders, baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, and all those other things as well? Amen? Amen. And so certainly he was accurate in all the things uh, that he wrote about. Now, and one reason why, and, and some of you know this, one main reason why some historians reject Luke's writings and any writings of the Bible is because they are anti-supernatural. They are biased against the supernatural. And because they're biased against the supernatural, they cannot accept it as being true. Uh, but, you know, even that, to me, is, is irrational. And the reason why is because that, that presupposes uh, that our minds uh, can comprehend everything that really exists. And the truth is, our minds cannot comprehend everything that really exists. There are things, let's say, uh, a thousand years ago uh, that, that people could never really comprehend that are now existing even in the natural right now, isn't there? They could never comprehend even a hundred years ago. Well, maybe 100 they could, uh, but 125, 150 years ago, they couldn't comprehend a television. They couldn't. I remember when I was a boy, I couldn't comprehend the Internet. How about you? Isn't that right? And so just because our minds are not able to comprehend something, in this case, the supernatural, miracle-working God, does not mean it's not possible at the very least. And I would submit to you, if you believe in God, you've got to believe in miracles, right? Are you following what I'm saying? All right, and so again, I just uh, throw that out to you. Now notice, let's go on with this now. Number 2, verses 12 through 13. And, and we had the quote from the Scripture, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Letter A, it seems the encouragement, note this, it seems the encouragement the Lord gave Paul in verses 9 and 10 came just in time before persecution rose up again. Isn't that just how God is? God is always on time. Now, he may not always be on your time, but he is always on time, right? And so God, knowing ahead of time what Paul was going to face, he was going to face more persecution from the Jews and be brought before the proconsul and everything, God already spoke to Paul and said, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. I'm with you. And I'm sure that gave him a boldness. Notice as it goes on. Uh, with this, regarding this, Grant Osborne gives us insight, and we give another quote. The Lord had promised that no lasting harm would result, not that no charges against Paul would be raised. The animosity of the Jews reached new heights, and they try a new strategy, going to the Roman proconsul. Proconsul, by the way, is like the governor, if you will. Going to the Roman proconsul rather than to the rabble. In other words, now Paul is facing legal opposition as his opponents bring up official charges similar to Jesus before Paul. Pilate. And so now it's not, it's not a physical, uh, you know, violent opposition. Now it's a legal opposition that they're trying. They're trying a different approach. As we go on with this, notice lowercase b. This was a very important trial, which would potentially affect all other Christians due to setting a precedent. Now I quote from Dr. Thomas Constable, another, he, this guy's a Baptist uh, scholar. He says this, a proconsul was the governor of a Roman province. And his legal decisions, note this, his legal decisions set precedent for the other proconsuls throughout the empire. Consequently, Galileo's decision in Paul's case affected the treatment that Christians would receive throughout the Roman world. This was the first time that Paul or any other apostle, as far as we know, stood trial before a Roman provincial governor. And so the idea is this, that because because Galileo did not feel that Christianity was a threat to the Roman government and therefore would not uh, pronounce them as being illegal and, and not able to practice their faith and all of that, because he did that, he set a precedent that now throughout the Roman Empire, for this time period anyway, uh, would not be considered illegal. In fact, for the most part, uh, the Roman government, up till now anyway, considered Christianity to be, a, uh, to be a, a branch of Judaism. And Judaism was a legal religion in the Roman Empire. And so they considered Christianity to be a branch of Judaism. And so, therefore, basically, by him not being willing to, to really hear the case that the Jews were bringing against Paul, by doing that, he's saying they are legal, they're okay, and it affected all of Christianity for that period of time. Does that make sense to you? All right, so let's go on with this. 
as it, as it reads on with this number three now, verses 14 through 16, about the middle of page one, it says this. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Now going on with the notes now, Galileo was not interested in this case because he didn't consider any Roman law being broken by Paul. Judaism was a legal religion in the Roman Empire and Christianity was seen as a branch of Judaism. I've already said that. I get ahead of myself sometimes. But notice, Dr. Utley offers some interesting thoughts. Notice now, this Jewish claim that Christianity was a violation of their laws and therefore not a part not a part of Judaism, was a very important legal issue. If Galileo had ruled on this charge, Christianity would have become an illegal religion. But as it was, Christianity enjoyed political protection. It was seen as a sect of Judaism, which was a legal religion under Roman law until... Nero's persecution 10 to 12 years later. It is even possible that one of Luke's purposes in writing Acts was to document that Christianity was not a threat to Roman authority. Every Roman official is recorded as recognizing this fact. And so for about 10 to 12 years, according, according to Utley, uh, this was a safe place in terms of not being prosecuted by the Roman government. However, many of you are aware of Nero, the emperor. As he came along, Nero hated Christians. He hated Christians. I mean, he seethed with anger. I've said this before in different settings. Uh, you know, I believe that Nero was demon-possessed because he not only hated Christians, he found, a, he found creative ways to kill them slowly. Uh, whether it be covering them with tar and then burning them alive, or whether it be a, a slide that they would slide down that was like a blade that by the end they would be cut in half, and, and that kind of thing that, that he hated. In fact, his uh, garden outside of his home, his palace, uh, was, uh, was lit up at times by the dead bodies of Christians uh, being torched. They, they would be on fire, burning in his garden, and, and that was what he would do to, in order to provide light uh, for his garden. So again, I think he was demon possessed. Possessed. He was a man driven by hatred and, and demonic influence and everything like that. But uh, thank God, Christianity still reigns. And Christianity still got the victory. Isn't that right? And the Roman Empire eventually fell. Let's go on with this. Number four, verse 17. It says, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. This sounds strange. All of a sudden now, Sosthenes, who is now the new ruler of the synagogue, the other ruler of the synagogue got saved, Crispus, if you remember last year, or last week, not last year. If you remember Crispus from, Crispus from last week, he was the, the ruler of the synagogue, but he, be, he became a believer, he and his entire family. Now Sosthenes is the leader. And as it goes on, uh, Dr. Stanley Horton shares some interesting comments, the bottom of page one. The whole incident must have had a deep effect on Sosthenes, the fact that the Greeks took him and beat him and all that kind of thing. Finally, Sosthenes must have yielded to the truth of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, our brother Sosthenes joins Paul in greeting the Corinthians. Though we cannot prove it with certainty, this must be the same Sosthenes. It would be unlikely that there would be another prominent Sosthenes who was well known to the Corinthian church. Truly, the grace of God is marvelous. The, the leader of the opposition, a man who must himself have blasphemed Paul in the gospel, became a brother in the Lord. With this victory before uh, Galileo and the conversion of Sosthenes, there must have been more freedom than ever for the Christians to witness for Christ in Corinth. And so, again, the idea uh, that I really wanted to emphasize in this is that Sosthenes, who had been beaten by the Greeks, he was now the ruler of the synagogue. It's understood that he probably is the same Sosthenes that became a brother in the Lord. Thank God he was one time probably one of the blasphemers, some of the opposition against Paul and, and, and his team. But then he became a believer. Thank God for that grace of God. Amen. The grace of God can change men's hearts can change women's hearts uh, from being a, a persecutor uh, to a, a godly follower of Christ. Well, I'll tell you, the Apostle Paul is the greatest example of that, I would say. Uh, isn't that right? The great persecutor as Saul of Tarsus became the great apostle of faith. Praise God. Now as we go on, <clears throat> verses 18 through 23, Paul returns to Antioch in Syria and beyond. Let's, uh, let's go to our Bibles and let's read these verses. We've only gone as far as verse 17 in reading, so let's read. Let's read verses 18 through 23. Is everybody good? Verses 18 through 23. Now Paul returns to Antioch. Let's read. So Paul still remained a good while. That's he remained a good while still in Corinth. 
Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Notice Priscilla is now the first one mentioned, and most scholars that I've read after indicate that that's because she kind of took the lead spiritually uh, in that anointing and whatever. And so again, it says Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order, in order strengthening all of the disciples. All right, so there's a lot in there. Let's read this uh, now. Let's go back to our notes. All right, so we come to number one under uppercase B where it's titled, uh, Paul Returns to Antioch and Syria and Beyond. Verse 18, so Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brother and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off in Centria, for he had taken a vow. We can definitely conclude, as we read on, we can definitely conclude that at this point, Priscilla and Aquila are now believers because they went with him. Remember, last week, we couldn't be absolutely sure when he first met up with Aquila and Priscilla whether they were believers yet. They had come from Rome. Maybe they got saved in Rome. But he met them because they were of the same trade. But it's obvious now that somewhere along the line, uh, they became believers, and they became strong believers, as we've already said. Let, let's go on with this then. There's an odd mention here of Paul having his hair cut off because he had made a vow. No one seems to really know what this vow was about. Some suggest that it was an expression of thanksgiving to God for keeping him safe in Corinth, which would have been a, a possible Jewish uh, uh, way of expressing thanks. Others think it may have been an act to identify with the Jews who made Nazarite vows of dedication to the Lord. There are a variety of ideas concerning that, but for us, it doesn't matter why he made the vow. He just made a vow. Going on, Centria, he made that vow. Centria was a port town about seven miles from Corinth, and so he went to a port town. Why did he go to a port town? Because he's going to sail off, right? He's going to go. He's going to go to Ephesus in this case. All right, so let's go on with this. And uh, verses 19 through 22, it says, Paul goes to Ephesus, and after staying a short time and preaching in the synagogue, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila there and goes on to Caesarea, which was a port city where he would have landed in order to travel up to Jerusalem, where he, quote, greeted the church. He then went back to his home church in Antioch. And so if you look up on the screen for just a minute here, and so we go from Corinth, he goes from Corinth uh, to Ephesus. And, uh, and then he begins to, he stays there for a time. He, he uh, ministers there slightly, a little bit, uh, but he doesn't stay for very long. But later on, we, we see that he goes back to Ephesus and there's a major amount of ministry uh, that takes place in Ephesus. And notice now, as I stated, from there, he goes to Caesarea. Caesarea is, uh, is where he had to go. That was part of, that was a port city in Palestine. He would take the ship, as you can see. He had to take a ship from Corinth to Ephesus. You can see that on the map, right? So he took a ship, and, and then I don't know if I have it here. Do I have it here? Yes, I do. I have it. Thank God. And so from Ephesus, he went to Caesarea, which was a port city in Palestine, uh, where he would go from there up to Jerusalem, where he was going to uh, see the brothers and sisters in the Lord. He, it says that he must go for the feast in Jerusalem. Uh, that was understood uh, uh, from scholars that he was going at the time of year would have, would have, would have been the Passover. Uh, the Jewish feast of Passover. And so from Caesarea, that port city, just a little bit from there was Jerusalem, and he would have went to that church and then and, and encouraged the church. So let's go on with this now. It says, uh, from there he went to Antioch. He went to Antioch, and you can see it up on the map, from Jerusalem, he went to Syrian Antioch, or Antioch in Syria. And let's read on from here in our notes. Notice now. First, let me mention here, the end of number two, it says he then went back to his home church in Antioch. Now, some of you remember this. In Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3, you remember that in Antioch, that's this Antioch shown on the map. There's two Antiochs. That's why I'm emphasizing that's this Antioch. Uh, this Antioch is where the prophets and teachers were found in Acts 13, 1 through 3. And then uh, as they were ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke. You remember the story. Many of you probably do. The Holy Spirit spoke as the prophets and teachers were ministering to the Lord, and uh, Paul and Barnabas were amongst them. As they ministered to the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Paul and Barnabas, whereunto the work, uh, unto the work whereunto I have called them. 
They laid hands on them, prayed for them, and they began that first missionary journey. Now, after the end of the second missionary journey, Paul goes back to his home church. How many of you know everybody needs a home church? Amen? Everybody needs a home church. And so he goes back to Antioch in Syria. Let's go on to our notes now. It says uh, in number 3, verse 23, it says, After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order to strengthen all the disciples. And that would have been up in between Antioch and Ephesus. He went to the province of Galatia and Phrygia and ministered there as well. After he had spent some time, though, in Antioch. That, we don't know exactly how long he went there, but he went there. Now notice now, he went strengthening all the disciples. And you can compare that to chapter 16, verse 6. Now notice in the bold, this verse introduces the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. The beginning of Paul's third missionary journey happened when he left Antioch, Syria. He went back to his home church. He went back to his base. And then from his base, he launches off again. I don't have it on a map here, uh, but he goes between uh, Antioch and Ephesus through the provinces of Galatia and Phrygia and goes back and strengthens believers. If you remember, in the second missionary journey, he went and he started churches. He ministered. He evangelized. And uh, you remember in the province of Galatia alone, uh, there was uh, Antioch, Lystra, a different Antioch. Antioch, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium that were major cities in the province of Galatia. And he ministered them, started churches and all of that. And so Paul sees the necessity, as we've seen before, of going back and making sure believers are doing well, making sure they're being discipled, they're being taught, they're becoming strong, strengthening, it says, of the disciples uh, in those places. So that begins really in verse 23, the third missionary journey. Then we take a little bit of a pause and we'll come back to his third, his third uh, missionary journey. But let's read here what Dr. Horton, Stanley Horton, writes about the middle of page two. And here's the quote. Paul spent some time, probably about six months, in Antioch encouraging and teaching the church. Then he went north by land on a 1,500-mile journey throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia. One after another, he visited the churches founded on his first and second journeys. Paul never started churches and forgot them. Always he sought to go back to give further teaching and to establish and strengthen new believers. That is, he was always as much concerned with follow-up as he was with evangelism, right? And so he went back to some of those same churches, all right? Now, let's go back to our Bibles, and let's read, beginning with verse 24. Is everybody doing okay? We'll read verse 24. In fact, I, I think what we'll do, we'll read through the end of the chapter. We won't expound, I don't think, on all the way to the end of the chapter. We might, but it's not going to be in the notes, so I might expound without the notes, which I'd have to reiterate next time so that I could include it in the notes, right? Because we can't have we can't have imperfect or incomplete notes, right? But we'll see what happens here. Let's read verses 24 through 28. That's the end of that chapter. Then we can at least say to some extent we finished chapter 18, right? So verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So now you know Paul is between Galatia and Phrygia ministering, but now we see Apollos here in Ephesus. Now remember, Paul left. Uh, left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, right? And so Priscilla and Aquila are in Ephesus, and now we come up with this guy, Apollos. And so he was an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures. He came to Ephesus, verse 25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. It just so happens Apollos is one of my favorite guys uh, in the New Testament. He, he is a uh, just an amazing fellow. Let's, let's read now to our notes here. It says in letter C, verses 24 through 28, the ministry of Apollos. Number one, verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Letter A. Apollos is a remarkable man. He's mentioned several times in the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, and then also in Titus, and I give the references for that. You remember, I think it was last week I mentioned uh, that Paul was having problems a little bit with the Corinthians uh, because they were, they were divided over their favorite preachers. 
All right, you know, some would say, well, I'm of Apollos. Others would say, I'm of Paul. And they were kind of divided because they had their favorite preachers. There's nothing wrong with having, I guess, preachers that you receive from better than others. And I think there's no doubt uh, indicated from this passage that we just read that Apollos was probably a better preacher than Paul. Nowhere does it say Paul was eloquent. Nowhere does it say uh, that Paul, uh, you know, was uh, uh, in that way able to, uh, able to keep the audience. It seems that Apollos was, was unique in this way. He was, you know, Paul was educated. Paul was mighty in Scripture, no question about that. But Apollos was an eloquent man, educated, and Paul was too. But there was something about the way Apollos ministered. And so the Corinthian church, you know, he said, uh, you know, he had to correct them. He said, you're causing division over your preachers. You're, you're saying, I like this one. One, I like this other one and all that and they were causing division how many of you know division is never of God like that isn't that right and, and so he brings correction he says Apollos planted I watered but God gave the increase in the third chapter of first Corinthians so he's basically saying everybody's got their gifting everybody's got a uniqueness if everybody every preacher and every other person in ministry which is every Christian by the way if everybody just flowed in the grace that God put on them everything would be all right amen because we're not in competition. There's no such thing. There's not supposed to be competition in the body of Christ. Just like 1 Corinthians 12. Again, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, uh, the Spirit of God through Paul said, you, you know, there's the hand, there's the foot. The hand can't save the foot. I don't need you. The eye can't say uh, to the ear, I don't need you. And the head can't say to anybody, I don't need you. Why? Because every part supplies something. Isn't that right? And each of us as parts of the body of Christ. We all supply something. We all have different giftings. Thank God we're not all one big eyeball or one big ear or one smelly foot or anything like that. We've all got a uniqueness. I don't want to go without a foot. I don't want to go without a hand. I don't want to go without an eye or an ear or anything else. I want them all, but they don't all function the same. Isn't that right? Amen? And so thank God for the body of Christ. That's the same with the body of Christ. Let's go on with this now. Also, uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Constable also said this. Apollos... Whose, form, whose formal name would have been Apollon, Apollon, Apollonius, I guess, may have arrived in Ephesus after Paul had departed for Jerusalem on his previous journey. That is the impression Luke gave. In any case, he was from Alexandria, the capital of Egypt, in case you wondered where Alexandria was, the capital of Egypt. So he was, he was Jewish, but he was from Africa, Egypt being a part of northern Africa. Furthermore, he was a Christian Hellenistic Jew. That means he was a Greek-speaking Jew an eloquent man who had a thorough understanding of the Old Testament, a gift of communicating and defending the faith and enthusiasm. All right? And where does he get all of that? He gets that by letter B. An eloquent man. The word eloquent means pertaining to attractive and convincing speech. This word also includes the idea of educated. And so he, he had attractive and convincing speech. And it also had the idea of being educated. He was a very educated man. He spoke with, with uh, you know, the right kind of language. And really, that was important in Corinth because Corinth was an educated place. Greece was known for knowledge. They almost worshipped knowledge to some extent. All right? And so it was important that he was uh, speaking in an educated way. I don't know about you, and maybe I'm picky, but I, I don't like it when I hear a preacher say ain't. Or when they use bad, I just don't like it. And, you know, I, I'm not necessarily the best in English, uh, but, you know, some words, I mean, like ain't, I mean, you know, that's not, really, that's not really a good witness, I don't think. You know what I'm saying? Because some people that are educated, they say, oh, man, he's just an ignorant, dumb preacher, and he's speaking like an old hick or whatever. And, and, and you, know, you know, let's just speak in the best English we can so that we can communicate with everybody. And believe me, sometimes I'm guilty because, you know, I, at home, I'll say things like, is the water head up yet? You ever hear that before? Is the water head up? That means... Pam always gets on me. She said, you mean heated. Say heated up. Okay. Is the water heated up? You knew what I meant, though. Is the water head up? You know, I grew up, my father always said, is it head up? Is, is the water head up yet? You know, he just used that. And so you catch on to those things. Isn't that right? And so I can be guilty of bad English sometimes, too. But anyway, Apollos was not. It goes on, letter C. He was mighty in the Scriptures. The word mighty means powerful, strong, capable. He was capable. He knew the Word of God. It's so important that all of us know the Word of God. You know, just preachers shouldn't be those that are mighty in the Scriptures. Every believer ought to have as a goal, I'm going to be mighty in the Scriptures. Amen? 
I'm going to be powerful, strong. I'm going to be capable. I'm going to know the Word of God. I'm going to get the Word of God in my heart, in my mind. I'm going to have it coming out of my mouth. I'm going to have it in my, in my heart so that in any given occasion, any given circumstance, the Word of God comes out. Isn't that right? I mean, that ought to be true of every believer, you see, because every believer needs to be strong in the Word of God. And then verse 25. It says, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. That's Apollos. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Letter A, he had been taught by someone and now was teaching others. And that reminded me when I wrote that, that reminded me of 2 Timothy 2, 2, where Paul said to Timothy, the things which you have heard of me teach the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so Paul told Pastor Timothy, who happened to end up being the pastor of Ephesus, the church at Ephesus that we talked about briefly, uh, he, Paul, said to Timothy, find faithful men, teach those faithful men so that they can teach others also, right? And so Apollos had been taught, and he was now teaching. He was a faithful man. And then let her be, he taught accurately, but there were some areas he was not knowledgeable of because it states that he knew only the baptism of John, which infers uh, that he did not know about water baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, possibly he didn't know about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the speaking in other tongues yet. It's possible he didn't know some things. But yet he spoke and taught accurately with the light that he had from the Scripture, right? In other words, he spoke and taught according to what he had already understood. He was accurate in what he did teach. He was just lacking in some things uh, that he didn't know about. Isn't that right? And, and boy, I'll tell you, I thank God for Apollos uh, because uh, I'll mention some things in a minute about that as well. But notice letter C. He was fervent in spirit. In the New Testament, that's NT New Testament, this is only used figuratively of being stirred by the Holy Spirit. So he was stirred by the Holy Spirit. It also means literally to boil in the Spirit and to show enthusiasm. And so you know what? Apollos was gifted uh, in his fervency. He was moved by the Spirit of God. He showed enthusiasm when he spoke. You know, the word enthusiasm actually means God within if you look up the word, the original meaning of enthusiasm, it means God inside. Uh, and so when you know God's inside and you sense God's inside, you are enthusiastic. Isn't that right? Is everybody with me here? Uh, and so, you know, I thank God for him. I'm just going to read another scripture before we end this real quick. I know I ended in the notes, but notice it says this in verse 26. So he began to speak boldly. That means with confidence and courage in the synagogue. But when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And so he taught accurately. But how many of you know that all of us can go from accurate to more accurate? And thank God for Apollos. He was a humble man. It doesn't say that, but it's obvious by the fact that he listened to them. Here's this man and woman, husband and wife. They go to Apollos, who, who knows and, and you know, has had great uh, results, had spoke eloquently, was mighty in the Scriptures, but yet he was a humble man. Because here comes Priscilla and Aquila, saying, you know, you know, probably encouraging him first. How many of you know when you bring correction, it's always good to encourage first and then let him have it? I'm just kidding. But anyway, it probably encouraged them and everything, but then he taught, they taught him more accurately things about the baptism of uh, the Holy Spirit, perhaps, or the baptism in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, and, and those kinds of things, and who knows what else. But he was humble enough to receive. He was humble enough. He didn't go off and say, oh, who are you to tell me? I'm mighty in Scripture. I, I'm eloquent in speech. Look at the results I've had. No, he didn't act that way. He received. And then when you receive that correction, how many of you know you end up doing better than ever? Isn't that right? Amen. Praise God. 